Hi, my name is Simao and I'm part of the Burley Church community. So lately God has been challenging me on this concept of faith and what faith is. And I think we all, all of us have a general idea of, of what is faith and that we can place our faith in God, uh, but sometimes we can place our faith or our trust in ourselves or in others, unfortunately. Recently, Kirsten, my wife and I have had to make some really tough decisions and that has led us to really revisit this concept of faith and, and healing. And sometimes when we, um, when we journey through life and we don't go through um, hard times, it's, it's easy kind of not to think about these concepts that often or to, or to have quick answers to give to others uh, when they go through, through hard times. So we have started questioning if God wants to physically heal all the time. And when that doesn't happen, because it doesn't happen all the time, we all know that, why, why is that? And when healing, physical healing doesn't happen, um, is it because of my personal lack of faith? Uh, or as a couple, our personal lack of faith? Or is it because somehow God is trying to punish us? And if God doesn't heal physically all the time, is it because ultimately He doesn't want what is, what is good for me? Now, obviously, I believe that God is, is good and, and, and that He wants what is, what is good for me. So, so should my expectation be that God will then heal all the time. So when our prayers uh, and our petitions for physical healing weren't answered to or haven't been answered to, um, in a sense, our expectations weren't met. So, so, so what, what does that mean? So all of that led to a season of, of confusion and sadness because ulti ultimately what we wanted to happen didn't happen. But in the middle of this season, um, I believe that God has taught us some really important things and has reminded us of things that, um, that it's so easy to forget. So I believe that in our prayers, it's, it's okay to, to ask God for the things that, that we want. It's okay to say, God, I believe this is the best for me and I'm praying for this. But I think we always got to remember that the most important thing is for God's will to be done in our lives. I think we always have to align our prayers with the way that Jesus taught us to pray. So when Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, He said, God, let your will be done. And when Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before He was crucified, He said, uh, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, but let not my will be done, but your will be done. So I was reminded that ultimately my faith needs to be placed in God, trusting that His will is the best thing for me. Now, in a sense, it's actually easy to have faith when I want things to happen my way, but it's harder to have faith in God when things don't happen our way, isn't it? Uh, it's harder to trust God when what I think it's the best for me doesn't happen. But I believe that is a test of, of genuine faith, is to, um, is to say, God, this didn't happen my way, but my faith is still in you. My faith is still in your goodness and that whatever you will, whatever you want to happen, it's actually the, the best thing for me and my family. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Burley Church Online. Uh, if you don't know me, my name's John. I'm one of the elders at, at Burley Church. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're continuing our series on health and hope. Uh, if you haven't seen some of the other talks, I'd encourage you to, to go and have a look at them. Um, there's some fantastic talks. Steve did a great interview with a psychologist. Uh, Steve and Maren discussed some incredibly important truths around who God is and, and who we are. And Steve recently also encouraged us to deliberately set up some practices or rhythms in life and talked about some key principles of discipleship. So a lot of great stuff uh, to go and listen to. Before we go any further, I thought I'd give a bit of my background. Uh, I've been a doctor for 29 years. It's one of those things when you stop and think about it, you wish you hadn't because it, it makes me feel a bit old. But anyway, I've been a doctor for 29 years. But I've also had two major operations for cancer. I've had some blocked kidney stones, so my female patients tell me that I've got some understanding of the pain of childbirth, I've had a few fractures and stitches, etc. So I guess you could say I've been both next to the sick bed, but also well and truly in it. Another part of my life, though, over the last five years, I've spent a lot of time studying and learning about intentional discipleship and how people grow in their Christian life. I've easily read more than a dozen books, listened to many podcasts, had 
millions of discussions with senior experienced pastors and been part of a monthly workshop over two years. Um, before I go any further, I'll just acknowledge some of the authors of Dallas Willard, John Mark Comer, David Mathis, N.T. Wright, and Henry Cloud and John Townsend. They will contribute to some of this material that I'll talk about. So today, I sort of want to put these two life experiences together. I'd like to look back over one of my serious health experiences, but with the lenses, with the glasses of discipleship on. And I'd like to do that with a view to seeing whether this discipleship growth stuff really makes any difference. We're sort of going to put the blowtorch of a major health problem onto the principles of discipleship and growth and, and see whether it stands up. Because we're talking about real people. Um, people going through a, a health situation are in a very vulnerable time of life. So if I'm going through it or I'm alongside someone else going through it, I want to know that this stuff is really valuable. I, I want to know, is it really valuable or is it just religious hot air, some empty tick boxes to tick? Uh, so that's where we're heading today. So to set the scene, I'll just summarise five years of discipleship learning in five minutes. Now, this will go to air on Sunday the 25th of October, so that's two months to Christmas. So I think that gives me official permission to use a Christmas analogy. And it's too bad if it doesn't, I'm going to do it anyway. One of the classic pictures that comes to mind when I think of Christmas is a decorated Christmas tree with lots of beautiful presents around it. You may be able to see a couple of pictures in the background there. So I'd like to, to bring an analogy with that. Instead of the Christmas tree in the middle, I'd like you to picture Jesus standing there and, and surely Jesus is our greatest gift. And I'd like you to picture him holding out three beautiful presents. These presents are the words of truth from his mouth, his listening ear and his ministering body. Let's look at each of those in turn in scripture. First of all, the words from Jesus' mouth. John 6.63 6, says, The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. These words I have spoken to you, this is Jesus speaking, these words I have spoken to you, they are full of spirit and life. So Jesus' words and truths, they're, they're a stream of life-giving spirit. That's a fantastic gift. The second gift is Jesus' listening ear, and Scripture has encouragements and commands about this. Psalm 10, verse 17. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You encourage them and you listen to their cry. Philippians 4, verse 6. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. This scripture shows us that God is waiting and wanting us to come to him. So that's an astonishing privilege that we can come into his presence and he will listen to our prayers. So that's another great gift. The third gift is Jesus' ministering body. John 7, 37 to 38. Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water shall flow from within them. So Jesus is giving a picture of the Holy Spirit, and as we come allow Jesus into our life, he fills us with himself as, as the spirit. But then amazingly, that spirit then ministers out of us to others. Steve talked about Ephesians 10, 24 to 25 last week. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. There's many other verses in Scripture, the one and others of Scripture. Scripture's clear that as believers we have the indwelling Spirit of God and God often chooses to minister through his people, through his body. Another incredible gift. So we've got these three life-giving gifts, the words of Jesus, his listening ear and his ministering body. The thing with gifts is, though, you can have the best gift in the world at the foot of the Christmas tree. 
but you won't benefit much unless you go over and open it up, unwrap it, open it. James 4.2 says that you do not have before you do not ask God. Now that's not a meaning there's a guarantee you get whatever you ask for, but it does highlight this principle that sometimes we don't ask for things, we miss out. So there's this um, this importance of opening up some of these gifts. And that's where these practices or the, there's different terms, practices, spiritual disciplines, I like grace rhythms in life. These practices provide a means to open up these great gifts, a way to access and receive them. And if you think about it, there's something really relational about that. If you think back to your childhood standing there next to mum or dad or in their lap, opening up the present together, it's, it's all very relational and interactive. So just a couple examples. Uh, regular Bible reading or study or Bible study. Uh, that's a, a grace rhythm that unwraps the gift of God's words of truth. Another way to open that could be listening to a biblical teaching podcast. And what about regularly attending a, a large gathering or church service? That opens up, if there's biblical teaching, it opens up the gift of God's word. But it also opens up the gift of God's ministering body. And you receive encouragement from the fellowship, corporate worship uh, and prayer together. So that's a couple of examples and um, I'm pretty sure you're getting the picture now. So that was five years of discipleship in five minutes. Three great, great gifts, the words of truth from Jesus, his listening ear and his ministering body. And these practices or grace rhythms help us to open up these gifts and to receive them. So with that in mind, I'll go on to one of my stories. So I was 39, 39 years old. My youngest daughter of our three daughters was two years old. I got a phone call then I'll never forget. It was from my urologist with the results of my prostate biopsy, confirming that it was cancer. Uh, so this was significant for me on many levels. One of the questions that immediately was in my mind was am I going to see my kids grow up? Uh, I'd also watched my father pass away from prostate cancer, so that was well and truly in my mind. Um, and there was a lot of questions about what the future would hold. So in this situation, did any of these discipleship practices or, or grace rhythms help? Well, let's look at the gift of Jesus' ministering body first. I wasn't a perfect disciple by any means, but we were part of a small table, a home group, and had been for about three years. This was a wonderful source of support and encouragement for Miriam and myself through this time, whether it was through prayer, through just being a listening friend, just someone being there, uh, a card with a nice scripture. Uh, they gave us a gift of a night's accommodation at a nice hotel. God ministered incredibly well through them. I also had three very close fresh Christian friends. One gave me a, a great encouraging word from God, but I was able to share honestly with them and, and go through this journey together. Of course, I also had a, a close family. Um, some of us may not have close family, so I'm mainly going to uh, just talk about the, the, the church family. As, as it goes with discipleship principles. Now, sometimes in life, someone just gives you a gift. It's not wrapped, it's not in anything. It just plops into your lap. And God does the same thing occasionally. So I'd like to share this part of my story. As part of the workup for the operation, I had to have what was called a bone scan first. And this scan was going to tell me if the cancer had spread to my bones. If it had spread to my bones, normal medical treatment would not be able to cure it. The way the situation was, I had the bone scan and I was going to have to wait two weeks until my doctor's appointment. So I was facing this two weeks of, of uncertainty. But as the bone scan finished, the technician came over. He leant over me and I could see his cross dangling down off a chain. And he said quietly to me, look, I'm not supposed to do this, but I've looked at your scan. It's completely normal. And that was God ministering to me through him in a real way. 
It was a relief on one level, obviously, that the scan was normal. But the other great encouragement was that this showed me that God was there with me, that he was concerned for me, and he would be staying with me. So the gift of Jesus' ministering body was a tremendous blessing. And the small table and a smaller group of very close friends helped me unwrap that and receive the gift. What about the words of Jesus, the words of truth from his mouth? Unfortunately, at one stage, uh, a church person said to me, I heard about your cancer. You need to look for the sin that has caused this and you need to get rid of it. So that was kind of out of the blue. Um, I didn't, didn't really need that actually at that time. There was quite a lot of guilt and shame uh, behind that comment. Um, fortunately, in the year or two prior to that, I'd been doing a lot of teaching about our, our identity and I'm sure Jesus led me through that. Um, Steve talked about identity last week. So I knew there was no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Um, I knew now we have the righteousness of Jesus given to us and our legal standing before God was innocent. So that helped me enormously. The other thing was, though, I was semi-reading the Bible and, and praying regularly at that time. And this was a way of opening the words of Jesus. And that same week, I read in John 9, verse 1 to 3, this story as Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus replied, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this has happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. I really feel God had led me to this scripture in my quiet times and blessed me with this. It was a specific answer. Uh, to the, to my troubled heart at the time. So were the words of Jesus va valuable? Absolutely, incredibly. And did regular scripture reading and reading teaching books of scripture help unwrap it? Absolutely. And lastly, to the gift of God's listening ear. I think like most people going through a difficult time, uh, I prayed a lot. Um, I prayed by myself, I prayed with my wife and kids, I prayed with others. And I think most people do in hard times. And God listened and answered. I've mentioned a couple of things already and I'll talk about another short story in a minute. But simply know I could come to God himself and he would be hearing my prayers was an immense blessing. So is all this discipleship? these principles, the great gifts of God, the practices or rhythms of grace, are they the real deal or are they just hot air? Well, in my experience, they are incredibly valuable. In a, in a difficult health situation, I think particularly unwrapping gifts with fellowship, particularly the small table and close friends, uh, prayer, scripture reading and biblical teaching, they were all incredibly useful practices. And that helped me open and receive God's gifts. Now you'll note some of these practices don't just suddenly happen. You can't suddenly develop relationships of a small table or be in a rhythm of, of reading scripture. So that's where Steve's recent exercise with the rule of life where he encouraged us to be deliberate about putting these practices in place as a regular rhythm of life is so important. These gifts are not just available Christmas Day. They're not just valuable for Christmas Day. They're available continually and, and available for our access. Thinking back over that time, what would I have done more of? Well, knowing what I do now, I would have um, spent more time doing the practice of lament, uh, the full practice of pouring out our hearts to God and then remembering the good things he's done in our life and through Jesus and then bringing our request to him. Um, and I think silence and solitude, just resting in God's presence, uh, would, be, would be valuable. In terms of if you're getting alongside someone going through a health uh, problem, I would say that the best help I found was from gentle encouragers, gentle supporters, gently coming alongside, offering help, 
small practical uh, gifts uh, and uh, just listening ears and, and a, a prayer friend, things like that, gentle support work really well. So the fact that these practices, these rhythms of life uh, work well shouldn't probably really surprise us because Jesus had these practices or rhythms of life continually. He was continually opening up the presence of the Father. As a young Jewish boy, he would have done much scripture reading and had a lot of scripture teaching. And he was able to use that scripture when he went toe to toe with Satan in the desert. He also regularly retreated for silence and solitude and prayer, unwrapping those gifts of God's listening ear and listening for his word. He also lived a simple, uncluttered life, which allowed room for him to do these things. He had a small table with the, with the disciples. He went to larger gatherings at synagogues. In the night in Gethsemane, when he was facing his enormous challenge of the cross, he engaged with his small group, he engaged with his intimate friends, and then prayed intensely with God. So by doing these things and connecting to God continually, he was able to live a life that faithfully brought glory to God through sacrificially loving and serving others. And I think in the end that living out these practices, connecting to God and his gifts, yes, it does help us through hard times, but more importantly, it enables us to be more faithful witnesses, revealing in some way his glory to those around us to a world that really needs it. Second Peter 3.18 says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and forever. So in the end, growing and maturing in our relationship with God is about bringing glory to him, bringing his kingdom into this world. Now, I mentioned before, sometimes God just hands you a present. And so last part of my story to finish off. A week before my operation, uh, we went with one of the families in the home group to a resort on Fraser Island. And we'd been out one afternoon swimming in the beautiful freshwater lakes there. We came back and we were milling around the, the foyer of the resort. I was in some wet board shorts and some sandy shoes. And I started to see some guys in tuxedos and um, some ladies in evening gowns. And uh, it ended up about 30 or 40 gathered in front of us. Here we are sitting with our kids in wet, wet shorts. And um, it turned out they were a Harvard University choir and they were using the resort as a, a rehearsal base before their tour of Australia. And they were doing a full dress rehearsal there and then. The conductor spoke to everyone who just happened to be around and he said their first song was written by somebody um, and he said that the purpose of the writer of this song was to convey the glories of heaven that await us with God. And they proceeded to sing one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard. And as I was sitting there sort of drinking this in, you know, I thought to myself, would God have arranged all this just to encourage me? Now, I'm sure he didn't. I'm sure there were many people blessed by that. But would he have done it just for me? And the answer was yes. And it really hit me. We have a, a wonderful, loving God who wants to come along and be with us and minister to us. Our God is magnificent. As Marin taught two weeks ago, he cares, he is good, and he is able. In the end, our hope is not in this world. Things of the world will fade, including our current bodies. I was never given a guarantee by God that all my health problems would be solved. But he did overwhelmingly reassure me of his loving presence, both now in this body, but forevermore at his side. So as we close, let's just unwrap a bit more of the gift of scripture. 1 Peter 1 verses 3 and 4 and 13. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead 
and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. I hope that encourages you as much as it encourages me. Uh, before we finish, I'll just pray. Father, we thank you that you are a loving and gracious and merciful and giving God. Thank you through Jesus you've brought us into an intimate and close and loving relationship with you. Father, we pray for those around us who are going through difficult health circumstances or other life problems. Lord, minister to them, bless them. Show us how we can be your ministering body each day to those around us in our networks and our neighbourhoods. All for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So again, thank you for being part of Burley Church Online. Hopefully it won't be too long before we can all get back together, maybe before Christmas. Uh, until then, thanks for joining us today. Have a good week. Thanks.